Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much for joining us for my second interview with members of the House of Lords. Uh, but just before we begin, um, those of you who are on our short mailing list and others as well may have had the very sad news that our former treasurer and much loved uh, person involved in almost every aspect of short life, Jonathan Davis, sadly passed away this afternoon. Um, our thoughts are, of course, with him and his family. Um, and we'll update you when there any kind of further information um, about the funeral arrangements, which, as you may have seen, will actually be held in Brighton. Um, but uh, Peter is in contact with the family and we will let you know there's more information for thinking of him and his family this evening. Now, uh, welcome to all of you and a particular welcome um, to my special guest, Lord Gordon Wasserman, um, who is... A recent member of Golders Green Synagogue, although he's actually been, been attending the shul on special occasions for special droshes for quite some years. Good evening, Gordon. Good evening. And I get, I just say that I will not be going to any divisions as Monroe Palmer did last. There is no House of Lords meeting. There will be no need to watch the text messages. There are no votes, no divisions. That's right. Is this because you don't go to them or because they're not happening? They're not happening now. Now is the uh, Holomoid <laughs> between uh, before they start again with the Queen's speech on the 11th. Right. So let's start. Um, as listeners um, who don't know you will gather from your accent, um, you're not from the UK. You're not perhaps one of the more usual members of the House of Lords. Um, please tell us something about your background, um, when, how you ended up in this country, and ultimately your trajectory that took you into the House of Lords. Well, it's a very, very long story. and We don't want to use the whole of the period I was <laughs> talking about it. But the reason I chose Leonard Cohen's um, song to introduce this discussion, this talk, is because I come from Montreal about three streets away from Leonard Cohen's home. And we went to the same high school, we went to the same shul, uh, we went to the same college in, uh, in McGill. And um, so it's the story of Montrealers grown up in a very uh, vibrant the community, Jewish community, which was a sub-community of the English speaking community, which itself was a sub-community of the very much larger French community. So we were uh, a community within a community and very rich one at that. We had um, a very strong uh, synagogue base. We had a big public library. We had five or six uh, parochial Jewish schools of which I went to one of them, uh, uh, you know, various shades from the communist one to the labor Zionist. And we were right of center labor Zionist and the, the the uh, Orthodox Zionist and so on. So it was I mean, I, the, a community in Montreal in the 40s and 50s uh, and 60s uh, was uh, uh, almost unique in the world as being, uh, uh, as I say, a, a community within a community within a larger community in North America. So it wasn't- Gordon, very... just, Gordon, just interrupt you for a moment. Um, there's been an audience request that you speak a little louder or perhaps close to the microphone. Yeah. If, you're if you're able to, I think we'll be appreciated. Louder, usually is. it's I should be quieter. This time they want me louder. Okay. That's right. That's for Kate, that's for Kate to tell you to be quieter, but yeah. we'll ask you to be loud. Okay, good. <laughs> anyway, that's how I started. I started in Montreal, and as I said, related to Leonard Cohen, it was that, that community in Montreal um, 
from which I then went, I went to McGill and from which I graduated and won a Rhodes Scholarship. And the Rhodes Scholarship um, was to Oxford, that's where it is, and I had to come. In fact, there's a story with that. My father, and there was a dispute, a machloikis between my parents. My mother's view is England. She was a professor of English and she was very much Anglophile and she wanted me to go to Oxford. She was thrilled. My father, who was born in uh, Kishinev, um, shortly after the pogrom, he was a baby, he came and from Kishinev. He said, we don't want to go there. We were not going to Europe. We ran away from Europe. We came to North America. We don't go back to Europe. But my mother, who was a very powerful personality, um, prevailed and I came to Oxford. And um, from Oxford, I taught for a while. Then I went into the home office. On, um, and from that, I settled here and married children. And that's why I'm here. So to tell me a little bit more about, a bit about the folk shuler, you've given some, an interesting taster of the kind of varieties of, uh, of, of uh, kind of affiliations of Jews with Yiddish speaking backgrounds in Montreal in your childhood. But you went to the folk shuler together with several quite famous people, including Leonard Cohen, Professor Ruth Weiss, and, and I'm sure others. Can you give us more of a taste of what your childhood was like in this kind of Yiddish speaking environment? Well, first of all, let me say Cohen didn't go there. Cohen stayed oh, so in the West Bank. Well, okay, That's got right. That. Okay. But he he pretended to go there, but he didn't. He I see. Actually, was of a uh, the, he was in the shul with our contacts, but Yiddish was I not see. his parents' thing. He okay, came much so. earlier than Apologies. my grandparents. So, so, so tell me, tell me, tell us about the Shash, the Shash Shemaim. Tell us about the Shash Shemaim shul. The Shash Shemaim was an extraordinary, is an extraordinary place. It's an enormous shul. If you've seen photographs, it's the, one of the most beautiful sanctuaries, as they call it, in, in, in the world, uh, started by German Jews uh, in Westmount, which was a suburb of Montreal, a wealthy suburb of Montreal. It was a very formal uh, uh, synagogue, but there was a wonderful rabbi, and he changed my life. Rabbi Wilfred Shushat, uh, who died only last year, and he interested me and took an interest in me and got me going. And the reason I'm largely the reason I'm in Golders Green is because of your drushes, Rabbi Belovsky. And that taste for drushes and taste of studying I got from Shushat because no one else did it, but he used to have a group every Shabbos afternoon. He would take five or six of us and we would work either learn in his flat or in his office, depending on the time of year, in his office if it was in the winter time when we went to Dublin early, or in his flat if it was in the summer. And um, he did this because he wanted to inspire in us, in us a love of study for its own sake. And um, that I was there for five years, uh, even though I was doing all kinds of other things. I was editor of the college paper and very active and very social. Every Shabbos afternoon, I would be with Rabbi Shushat and his five and my five friends. And we would study one book, Sefer Agadah by Bialik Revnitsky. And we worked on this uh, um, steadily. And that gave me the love of uh, uh, that kind of study, which has led me then to when I came back from New York, when I was there for 12 years in um, between 1996 and uh, 2008, when I came back, I asked people, I said, where can I get a drosha in, uh, uh, in London now? I had been going to uh, Bernstein in uh, Norris Lee. I'm looking for a drosha, and a friend of mine said, the best drosha is gold is green, Harvey Belovsky, he's your man. So at um, every uh, Shabbos and Godel and every uh, Shabbos Tshuva, I would make my way to Golders Green, as you know, that's where we first met. And, um, you know, after going, hearing you for so many years, I, I then moved, by the way, to Hampstead. I think that's the key. I moved to Hampstead about two years ago. I needed a shul here. Before that, I was going to um, Marble Arch, where there was no um, drushes going on. And I found that... Um, uh, a home, I think, in Gold is Green. It has a certain uh, spirit, it has a community feeling, it has a warmth, 
which um, is very special. And I'm not used to that because I was brought up in a shul where the chazan did the davening. The chazan stood in front of you and it was all very formal. They wore what I think in England is called canonicals. They wore robes and so on. And it was all very formal. And uh, even in Marble Arch where the um, it was, music was wonderful, but the feeling that you get in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur in Gold is Green really is something special. You remember, I gave it a try because I was worried. You didn't have a chazan and I'm such so keen on chazonis. I mean, my father had chazonis playing every day in the house and I grew up with that. And I was so keen, so I was rather worried about gold is green without a husband, but I loved it. It was wonderful, it was absolutely terrific. And um, that's what brought me to, uh, to join. Thank you. Um, let's go back. We found you um, joining the Home Office. Um, and then what happened then? There's a long trajectory, which you can tell us what your special interests were well, my... and where you, um, and kind of the areas which you specialize in and what you achieved over the years there. Well, life, you know, life is all about, uh, uh, I was going to say luck, maybe some people say it's not luck, it's what you make of it. But I never at any stage in my life planned uh, the, the, the future. I never looked ahead. I was in Montreal, very happy. I wanted to be in Montreal. I might have been president of the Shar Shemayim. You couldn't get better than that. Leonard Cohen's grandfather was president of the Shar Shemayim. You couldn't, be, but I then won the scholarship to Oxford. And when I was at Oxford, I married and I married um, Hugh Gateskill's daughter. And because of that, I suddenly got interested in, I got uh, well, interested in politics. I had been before, but I got to know many of the leading labor politicians. And it, I was then teaching at New College, teaching economics. But Roy Jenkins, who was the Home Secretary, um, was a friend because he'd been a, uh, a great acolyte of Hugh Gates Skills, very admirer of Hugh Gates Skills, uh, a mentee of Hugh Gates Skills. And he asked me to come into the Home Office as his economic advisor. I had no plan to stay in the Home Office. I loved it in Oxford. I had a wonderful house. I was then a... Um, tenant of Isaiah Berlin. He was next in my house and we were next door, we were over the fence. What could be greater than to be able to be in daily contact with Isaiah Berlin? So I had no intention of leaving, but I had an offer. So I went to the home office and that uh, was an enormous change in my life. I moved to London. I found I liked it. I loved it. I loved the civil service. I loved it more than I did teaching. I found that that's what uh, got me going. I needed to get up in the morning and get to the office. I loved that. And I stayed in the home office then for 27 years, including a period in the cabinet office when Margaret Thatcher was there. I was in the think tank. But then at some stage, I decided to uh, uh, leave before it was too late. Remember in those days, 60 was the mandatory retirement age. And I, I couldn't bear the idea of having to retire at 60. And what would I do? Go, be in the garden all the time. All my colleagues spent their time in Kent or Sussex growing pansies or sweet peas. And I didn't want to do that. I, won, I felt very active, so I decided to retire early, five years early, and I then by chance, by pure chance, was having tea uh, with a friend uh, who said he's an American, and he said he was now working in New York with Bill Bratton, who was the police commissioner of the city of New York, and my work in the, plea, in the home office had been mostly about policing. I was the official who's responsible for all the science and technology uh, supporting our police forces, forensic science, computery, and so on. And Bill Bratton then had, um, uh, took me to uh, tea when he was in town and asked me to come to New York. I was thrilled because I didn't believe it would ever happen because how many times you meet people and they say, 
I'd love to work with you. I will arrange it. And I remember going home and saying, um, Bill Bratton, I met him. He says I should come to New York. Now, at that time, one of my daughters was studying in New York. It couldn't have been better. It was really the most exciting opportunity, but I never thought it would happen. But Bill Bratton is a real mensch. And though even though he has himself had um, um, lost his job by then, he was fired by Giuliani, he arranged for me to come to New York. And in 2000, and sorry, in 1996, I went to New York. And once I was there, I was very, very happy. And I stayed there and I worked in New York Police Department, the Philadelphia Police Department, and so on. Uh, for some almost 12 years. And then I came back, that's another story. I came back before the election in 2010 and I worked with David Cameron on uh, the manifesto about policing because policing by then was my thing. I'd been in America. I had seen how American police forces in New York and Philadelphia had brought crime down, had made communities much, much safer. And I thought um, we should learn some lessons from America, very important lessons. And I came back and uh, I wrote the manifesto. And I then, um, uh, when the election took place and David Cameron won, he invited me to become an advisor to him. Uh, in fact, it's a longer story. Um, he wanted me to be a minister in the Home Office and in the House of Lords. But I didn't feel that that was my thing. I think it's very important to know, to know your strengths and your weaknesses. And I didn't want the uh, COVID of being in the House of Lords for the sake of it. I wanted to do a job. I had in mind keeping communities safer by introducing police and crime commissioners, which was my um, my mission. I felt it as a mission. So I said to David Cameron when he called, you remember Monroe told us the story of how they call you from number 10 and say, would you like to go to the House of Lords? He called me right after the election and said, would you like to be a minister in the House of Lords? And I knew the call was coming, by the way. I knew and I discussed with my daughter. My daughter very cleverly said, be very careful what you say. You don't want to do it. Don't say you'll think about it because he will flatter you. And then once you do it, it'll be the last time he flatters you. From that on, you'll be an employee and it'll be Taurus. You will have problems, only problems. So I said, no, I didn't want to go to the House of Lords. I didn't want to be a minister. I wanted to be an advisor and actually work in the Home Office and get change the way the police were governed. And um, and that was fine. And my friend said, oh my God, you don't turn down the House of Lords. What have you done? This will never happen again. Oh, what a mistake. And in fact, you know, it wasn't a mistake. In October, when that House of Lords list came out, which Monroe mentioned last week, um, just before that, I had the call from David Cameron and said, listen, would you go to the House of Lords now with no strings attached? You don't have to be a junior minister. You can just go there and to help with the legislation for this bill, which I'd been working on. So then I, I really, I, I, of course, I grabbed the opportunity because now I could be in the House of Lords and push my agenda. I'm very mission oriented. I very much want to get things done. I just don't want to do things. I'd learned over the years, doing things for the honor of it usually ends in unhappiness and uh, I was gonna say tears, not necessarily tears, but certainly uh, a failure to perform to your best and a certain amount of unhappiness. So my advice to young people when I talk to them is do what you feel you want to do, not because it looks good on your CV. Doing things because it looks good on your CV is usually a terrible mistake. You will perform badly, and the CV will be terrible. No, do what you feel you want to do, what you enjoy doing, and then the CV will look after itself. Yeah, yeah. that's very good. That's I, my also, story. 
Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm full confident that Dunstan Raiders never, ever do anything for their CVs. I'm sure that's, that's the case, but I'm sure that people appreciate that advice. So you told us why, how you ended up in the Lords. Um, and I've assumed you've continued while you're there to specialise um, in policing matters, because that has been, that is your specialist area and really the reason why you're there. Um, are there other areas that, that you've kind of taken an interest in? And what kind of legacy do you think there will be from your time as a peer? Well. There are two kinds of peers, some, some who have been members of parliament or active politicians speak on everything. You, there is a subject, they jump up and speak on it. I remember uh, once when I was first there sitting next to a former uh, conservative uh, uh, peer and the conversation was about parliament square and so on, whether it should be UNESCO uh, uh, um, site. And I said, are you going to speak? He said, no, I've got nothing to say about this. Lo and behold, two minutes later, he's on his feet. He said, I was in a taxi. That reminds me. Uh, the taxi driver said that some people are very, very good at it. I tend to speak only when I have something to say. And only when I have something to say, which not everyone else has said. You know, most debates have 75 speakers or these important debates about Iraq, about whatever, Prince Philip, whatever it is, there's 75 speakers, most of them say the same thing, but you know, not everyone says it, so they all want to say it too. I don't need that. I tend to speak only on subjects of which I feel I have an original contribution to make, and that's usually about policing and related matters. I did speak recently about the chaplaincy. I spoke about the chaplaincy because I felt it was something which really mattered. And if I didn't say it, probably no one else did. Although I managed to get the minister, the minister uh, to speak about it too. also to say something. But I spoke about the chaplaincy because I felt I really wanted to get a message across about how important it is. And I feel very strongly about this, how important it is to give Jewish students uh, a sense of worth, self-worth and respect and have someone who values them. And um, so I really wanted to get the message across. It was actually a debate about anti-Semitism and everyone was saying anti-Semitism is terrible, what we should do to, get, to, to, to fight it. My view is we live it. I, I take Jonathan uh, Sachs's uh, 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 view of this. It's a virus. It's been with us thousands of years. It's not going to end next week, next month, next year, but we have to live with it. And the chaplaincy, by giving support to Jewish students, make them feel self-worth, uh, is a way of tackling it. Not by persuading the others not to love them, no, but to persuade them to love themselves, to value their own uh, uh, you know, contribution to the world. And that's why I spoke. So I tend to speak only when I have actually something to speak, to say, which is on the, therefore much less common than uh, often than some people. Some people you can see guarantee there's a debate, there, there's, there's an and do, you know. Okay. So let's wind back just a little. Um, Given your background, which you described as kind of this like a slightly right of center, the origins that and the various kind of shades of um, European Jews in Montreal and your um, association by marriage with the Gate School family, um, you've ended up as a conservative peer. So how are you drawn to the Conservative Party? Why did you end up on the Conservative benches? Very, very simple. They asked me to the party I came to. I mean, you know, I go to the party to which I'm invited. I would have been delighted to work with Tony Blair on policing if he had any interest, but he didn't. I knew David Cameron because David Cameron had been in the home office as a special advisor when I was there and uh, we had uh, kept in touch. And um, I, he wanted, he liked what I was offering, which was a new approach to the governance of police forces making, in my view, making police uh, uh, the forces closer to the communities they serve. It's not so much in London, and London audience won't appreciate this as much, but if you um, 
live in, in outside London, you will see, you know, it's important for in a county, especially, I wanted to bring the community closer to the force that would, would serve them. And David Cameron asked me to come to the House of Lords, as I said, to be a minister and then go to the House of Lords. And since he asked me, I said, yes, it was the way of making a change for the country which I um, now lived and to which I was devoted. And if someone asked me to serve the country, good, I will do that. So uh, though I'm listed as a conservative, indeed, I believe in a certain amount of loyalty. I mean, there was a style, though there is a style, people join the parties, they become ministers, and then after two years, they leave them, finished. They done their work, they're now in the Lords, you can't take away their titles, but they become uh, crossbenchers and they are uh, critical. I um, have a sort of simple-minded loyalty. You put me there, you listen to my advice, you introduce legislation on my say-so. I will do what I can to make this legislation work and I will contribute to um, uh, the party's uh, policies on policing and, uh, uh, and community safety and cr criminal justice and, and, and so on. But I'm not someone who's out campaigning and canvassing. I mean, Monroe Palmer, your last guest, was a real major force in the Liberal Party. I mean, he, he, he was the treasurer. He's a, a party man to his fingertips. I am not. I'm there because I was put there by David Cameron and uh, I um, uh, have a certain residual loyalty to the party, although I'm not at all happy about Brexit. And that's a different subject. We're not here to discuss Brexit. It's not. <laughs> um, so I'm going to change direction slightly. Um, we, speak, we speak often, and we've been working together on a number of projects, some of personal interest and some of more public interest. Could you share some thoughts about one of them? Well, you've been very, very good to me in terms of putting me in touch with just the right person. I will uh, say I, I want to publicly acknowledge your uh, network of uh, contacts. And if I want someone to talk about a particular subject, you usually uh, uh, know them. They're in your Rolodex or whatever that what it is now is on, on it's the it's, it's, I, iPhone. iPhone now. But uh, one of the most recent and what I'm very much interested in, we've been talking about recently, is archives, Anglo Jewish archives. The need for members of Golders Green Synagogue and every other synagogue to keep the documents, the papers which they have in their uh, lofts in their basements, in their drawers, and not throw them away. I feel really very strongly about this. Um, Dora Gateskill's father uh, was a noted Yiddish journalist, Leon Creditor. He was the correspondent of from London of many North American uh, Yiddish papers, including the Montreal Yiddish paper, and I heard of him then because during the period of the war and immediately after the war and the founding of the state of Israel, he was the person who told the story from London in Yiddish for Montrealers whose main source of news was the Yiddish newspapers and North America. But I'm telling you the story because no one really bothered to keep his papers and to uh, maintain them. So when I met recently a young man whom you also met, who's writing a PhD, a non-Jew, writing a PhD on Yiddish journalists, he was so upset that I had Leon Creditor's papers. I mean, nothing, letters, books, magazine, and I allowed them to be thrown into the skip. Similarly with Dora Gateskill's very interesting papers relating to her background, her, she came from a Yiddish-speaking home. I mean, I didn't know the Gateskills as the politicians because Hugh Gateskill died before I married his daughter. But I knew Gateskill, Dora Gateskill, as a very active, interested Yiddishist who spoke Yiddish and knew the Yiddish press and so on. And that, because no one took care to keep these documents, 
they were all lost. So my message now to everyone, you rabbi and all the members of Golden Green, keep the papers you have, they're important. They tell a story of Anglo Jews. They tell a story which someday historians will want. And I am involved with an organization called YIVO, which you know, uh, which is the uh, YIVO, Y-I-V-O, stands for Yiddish Wissenschaft Organization. Uh, Yiddish uh, started in Vilna in the 1920s. Without their archives, we would have no story of Eastern European Jews. They were completely destroyed. The Nazis destroyed all documentation. And if not for YIVO's efforts to keep these archives, we wouldn't have a clue about what happened in places like Vilna and Warsaw and, and, and Lodz and where you name it, we wouldn't have a clue. And so I'm now sort of engaged in a passionate attempt to persuade people that this is a worthwhile activity. Don't throw the piece of paper away. You may not be able to read it because it's in Yiddish. You may not want to read it because you're not interested. It may belong to your grandparents, but never mind. it tells the story of Anglo Jews. And there's a quote from Weinreich, which I use all the time, who says, as long as the world exists, there will always be Jews who want to understand their roots in order to understand themselves. I think that's very, very important. And, there's, and I've been over this long and just, time. I'm just going just to interrupt you with this, which is in the event people do have papers or books that they don't want to keep anymore or they inherit, what should they do with them? Because you've made a passionate pitch for this project. We've been speaking about this for some time and I have managed to put you in contact with some professional archivists who have helped with this project. What should they do with them? They're going to matter to you like, oh, I'm about to move house. I've got six boxes of this stuff. I was going to throw it away. I was very inspired by Gordon's speech this evening. Tell me, Rabbi Velosky, I'm about to chuck them out. What should I do with them? My advice is <laughs> give me a few more months. Give me, and I will be send a note around to everyone in Golders Green when you and I, Rabbi Belovsky, do finish this job, which is using all the context. I had a very good talk with Dan Waterman of the, uh, Dawn Waterman of the Board of Deputies. She's the archivist there. We're going to work together with her and Yivo and you and other people you uh, put me in touch with. And we will very soon tell members of Golders Green Synagogue and all other uh, 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 Anglo Jews about where they can get professional advice about what to keep. We don't want butcher's bills from Menachem's. We don't want, we've got plenty of butcher's bills, though it might be interesting someday for historians, but we do want papers which describe a life, a style of life, where they went, where they went to school, why they did what they did, why they moved from one place to the other. These are fascinating issues, which I'm not a historian, but I can tell you historians I've spoken to long to have primary sources of this kind. And so we'll tell you what to do with them. You'll put them in a box. We will find a home. There are many very, very good archives in this country specializing in Jews and Jewish life, Southampton, London Metropolitan, and, and so on. And so thank you for that question. We will come back to you very, very soon with an answer. Okay. So I'm going to go to take a, um, a slightly more controversial direction. Um, I know that you've come out publicly against the proposal to build the Holocaust Memorial in Victoria Tower Gardens next to the House of Parliament. Can you tell us a bit more about this and why you've come out strongly against this proposal? Yeah, that, well, it's a difficult, very, very difficult issue. And before I go any further, I want to say I don't want to encourage disputes in the Jewish community. Rav Weiss, that great man who you, uh, Rabbi Belovsky, have uh, introduced into my life in a very big way, it gives me three or four hours less free time a week now listening to his shiurim, uh, uh, said the other day, we have enough people who don't like us outside. We don't need in the Jewish community to have people who fight against us and call us names. So I want to say at first, I hate the idea 
of having a real machloikis, a real dispute within the Jewish community about this. But let me say why I oppose this particular site. I don't oppose uh, museums uh, about the Holocaust, although I question their value as a tool of fighting anti-Semitism. I have a daughter who lives in Berlin and you couldn't have a bigger Holocaust memorial than in Berlin next to the Reichstag. And yet my own grandson was the subject of such serious anti-Semitism in the secondary school that he had to move out and go to a Jewish school uh, because he'd been to a Jewish school first. Then he tried the state system to a very prestigious school and that turned out to be a complete disaster because he was subject to physical and verbal abuse. And that's the city where there is an, an enormous Holocaust memorial in the key spot next to the American embassy. So I want to say the size of the uh, memorial is not related inversely to the amount of anti-Semitism. It's nothing to do with this. It's a different story. People who go to these museums are people who are interested because they care, because they have a sense of history and so on. So that's my question. The question is about a particular site. I oppose this site because I have a feeling about place. I think place is very, very important. This spot next to the Houses of Parliament is really rather special and means a lot and has meant a lot to Londoners and politicians and members of Parliament over a very long time. It's been kept empty with beautiful trees overlooking the river. It's a small spot. And to put a major construction there, I think, is not to respect the quiet, the special features of the place. I feel strongly about place. I don't think we need to shout about this with an enormous building. In one thing about London is buildings we've got plenty of. Trees and grass and quiet we're rather short of. And those of us who live around here and have the heat and the heat extension appreciate this. So those who live around and work, and as I did, around that spot regard this little park, this Victoria Gardens Park as a kind of gardens, special kind of other, I don't, I don't want to exaggerate, it's a slightly holy place, it's a special place, it's a quiet place, and for us to put there an enormous building, enormous building, I think would be a mistake. I think we couldn't then take it down. Once it's there, it's there. The other thing about it is all the experts in this subject, the planning inspectors, UNESCO, they've all said it's the wrong place because it's a very, this garden is special. The only people who are pushing it is the government. I mean, you know, the politicians, and they're using their brute parliamentary force to uh, overrule those local residents and the experts and everyone else who feels this way. So it's not about uh, a museum. We've got a museum coming, very, very good one in the Imperial War Museum. Let's tell the story. I, as you know, Rabbi Belovsky, I've spent the last three, two or three months, I read nothing else but books about the Holocaust, I can recommend to members of the synagogue, the, the Wall by John Hersey and others, the terrible stories. We want to know about it. We've got to know about it. We've also got to know that these things happen when you're not looking and I don't want to stir anything up and I want to be, I want to respect those people who hold that particular space in special regard. By all means, by the way, put a little, uh, put a, a statue there or some other memorial, as do one for slavery. But we're putting, talking here a multi story, gold plated, and literally gold plated uh, museum. Um, and I, I don't think we need it, but I don't want to make a machloikis. If that's what the community wants, fine. I don't want to make it into a dispute which 
tears the community to apart. That's terrible. And there was a piece this week I was very upset about by one leader in the community, then the other people say something, then they call them names. And we don't need people to call, we don't need our, we don't call ourselves names. We've got plenty of other enemies of our own. We don't need our own ones. Thank you for that. Um, now, before I ask for audience questions in the last few minutes, um, I wonder if you could tell us about any particular events or institutions or people whom you consider to have made the biggest or most important difference to you during a long and distinguished life? Well, I've already mentioned Matt Rabbi Wilfred Shushat, who most people have never heard of. He was very quiet. He, he made an enormous difference to my life by inspiring me with this love of study of Jewish uh, subject, which has lasted me uh, till now and getting worse if then nothing else. And I spending more time doing it all because he uh, inspired me. So if anyone wants to know the power of a, a, a teacher, a rabbi, to influence young people, I'm prepared to say that. It's amazing what this man did. He just simply did it because he wanted to encourage uh, young people for a love of Torah, and it, it's amazing. So that he was, in some sense, a very large influence in my life. Um, throughout, also in my life, um, not individuals in this kind of way, but I've admired uh, uh, people. I've learned a lot. Uh, I mean, I've got a love of music, which I learned, I, I picked up once, and I, I uh, walking was another thing I picked up, and uh, there people along the way, you meet someone, they have a hobby, they have an interest, suddenly they introduce you to it, it opens up a whole new world. Uh, and in this, as you say, long life, um, I have uh, had lots of people influence me. I mean, there was, I worked in Philadelphia with a police commissioner who had drive and enthusiasm, wanted to do things which made people safer. He inspired me to introduce the new system in this country. So over a long time, I, there are lots of people, but in a funny way, when I quietly, it, it, most unlikely people, other than my parents, who were both very powerful personalities, my father with the love of Chazon, which I've never uh, lost, my mother with the love of uh, reading, for example, in which, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, a long life, I'll have to give more thought to that uh, question. Very good question. You wrote it. Okay. Now, um, we finished. Yet? Thank you. We finished the um, the formal uh, conversation, and there's a little time for people who would like to send a question in the chat, or you can now selectively unmute yourselves. Um, and so we have uh, uh, ten minutes or so if anyone would like to ask a question. So you can wave. You can unmute yourself. You can send it in the chat. But you have to do something if you want this to continue. If there says two chats, there, yes. I, know. I, I see Don it. Waterman is there, which gives me great pleasure. Yeah, the, the, the chat says that the chat is open for questions. Oh. So how are we doing here? No. Well, I expect you've been so, Gordon, so extraordinarily comprehensive spellbinding that uh, people are so flabbergasted they're not necessarily able really? to think of a question they're going to kick themselves afterwards though um so gone here as a next uh, further request for questions that there must be something from the audience ah oh, here we go question from lewis this will kick it off where do you consider home canada or the uk from lewis turek Thank well, you, Lewis. It's a very, very interesting question. No, it's actually not such, it's an interesting question, but not a difficult question. I live here. I haven't been in Canada since 1959. Um, I, um, the thing about living in this country is they're very, very welcoming. I mean, some people don't like it because it means uh, you can be read the other way. What I mean is when I went back to Canada after having been a Rhodes Scholar, uh, they all said to me, we'd like you to come there's going to be a job advertised. We'll send you the forms. Maybe you can apply. Whereas in this country, 
I was actually urged to apply to become a, a Don at New College. And from then I was urged by Roy Jacobs to join him as a, and the, so I couldn't have been felt more at home, more welcome than when I came. I think that it's, it was a terrific uh, introduction. I came, I was an only child. I missed my parents. I had all my friends. By the way, I am still in touch with my Canadian friends. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, I, my folks, Shula, we had a folks re reunion, virtual reunion yesterday, four of us speaking Yiddish about the old days, the Mullah Ketzaiten and so on. But I am here. This is my home. I, um, though, I, the, you know, the, the, it's a, I say it's an extremely good question. In fact, when I first came, whereas I was in the home office, I was an official and so on, I still had people in the Hampstead tube station in the lift when it goes down uh, saying to me, if I spoke to another American, why don't you people go home? You're all so loud, which I found interesting because gold is green. I'm quiet compared to gold is green people. Uh, Evelyn, Evelyn, yes, please do. Love you. Evening. I, I really am enjoying this very much. In fact, I've sent something to you in the chat because I went to school with your wife, I believe, at North oh, really? But I've sent that in the chat. Let me just say, I wanted to ask Munro last week, actually. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between the Jewish peers in the House of Lords. I mean, I don't want you to obviously divulge too many secrets, but there must be occasions when possibly you don't all agree on some of the subjects that are perhaps important to Jewish people. I'm just interested how you interact on you know, on certain subjects. Do you meet together and discuss things if you're talking about Israel or anti-Semitism or something like that? I'm just a little bit interested because I'm thinking just myself of the, the members of the House of Lords that I, I don't know personally, but we know of. I'm just interested okay, in that. Very good. And here's the answer, several answers. One is we meet, it seems to me, very often, Erev Pesach, Erev Shavuos, there's a party, it's organized by I uh, sometimes the uh, leadership council of the board of deputies and Hanukkah lights are lit and so on. So there's an awful lot of getting together. There are disputes. Some people think we shouldn't have gefilte fish. Some people say we should have gefilte fish. Maybe we should have herring. I want herring. They don't want herring, you know. So we have disputes. But when it comes on the whole to Jewish issues, that's Israel and people like Monroe and his party, and uh, there's plenty in the Conservative Party, the Labour Party, are we speak as, I, on the whole as one. I, I, have, I don't think there's any dispute about is, Israel issues. Uh, I mean, some people uh, may not be very happy with the present government, other people are happier, and so on. But when it comes to uh, getting out a crowd or asking questions, uh, they're very good. And by the way, this is organized. It doesn't just happen uh, because, you know, we think about it. There are, there is a, uh, the conservatives have a, someone from the Friends of Israel who helps us by warning us that this is coming and that's coming and so on. The job, um, uh, it's, it's very, very well organized, um, uh, you know, with a young man who, who does it. And, and, and um, so I think in that sense, where there's a large number of Jews. I mean, you know, the, the, those who keep running tally and say there's 75, some have said 74, maybe it's not so, you know, but what, they're, what, you know, 15% or whatever it is. So there's an awful lot of Jews. They all um, uh, participate. I would say I don't know any of the Jews who um, are on any other side. I mean, who come out and say, to, to take a view which we would disapprove of. I, 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 it's a very good. Thank you. I have a question in the chat from Mervyn. Is the apprenticeship of Dudi Kravitz a realistic impression of the Montreal community and growing up there? Oh, I'm so pleased you asked that question. This is from Mervyn's question. Because I, I tell you why, Mordecai Richler, who wrote it, was a, a student of my mother's at the uh, at university. And I remember now she came home one day with a piece of an essay he'd written, creative writing. She said, you want to read this, very good. And he was more or less Dudy Kravitz, uh, you know, as a student, you know, the same story with the, the shtick about uh, the Jews growing up in 
that part of uh, Montreal. And he spent the rest of his life uh, writing the same story with different names and different. Uh, and in fact, he came, he, my, every time my mother came to visit me in Hampstead, he'd come and um, uh, uh, have, have dinner with us and so on. So I, I got to know him quite well. Um, as the question was not that, the question is it a good, is it a realistic picture? Yes, of a particular bit of Montreal, which I wasn't a member of. Uh, uh, my lived in Westmount, which was uh, very much an anglicized, uh, very much people who had already been born. My mother was born in Montreal, uh, people who had money and have big houses and all the rest of it. Uh, Duty Kravitz is the opposite. The Duty Kravitz, the picture is growing up in the East End of London, as it were, uh, where my father had grown up originally, and the Yiddish speaking, and my friends in the Volkshola, uh, we're all grown up there. Now, it's an interesting story which Ruth Weiss tells as well. Her mother had moved, my mother was born in Westmount and then moved to the, when I was born, moved to the, as it were, the East End in order that I might go to the Jewish, to the Yiddish school. I mean, she actually left where she was in this comfortable, rather uh, elitist, um, uh, plutocratic bit of Montreal and moved to uh, the Duty Kravitz place, uh, not quite there, but between the Duty Kravitz place, so that I might be able to get to school in this years. My mother was a tremendously keen uh, believer in Yiddish as the Jewish culture. She didn't have any time for religion. She didn't have any time for that. We didn't have a kosher home. What she believed in is Yiddish, Yiddish culture, Yiddish poetry and theater, newspapers, and so on. And that was what I was brought up in school. And it was all about Jews have a, are a nation, we have a language, it's Yiddish, and we have a culture, it's Yiddish, and we must know about it. We have a religion, and some people are religious, other people aren't, but it didn't matter. That's Thank you. Point. I think that's a really, um, probably quite a, a poignant place um, to end. Um, thank you all very much for joining us and thank you uh, very much to Gordon for his insights, um, the personal insights, professional ones, his little kind of window into his part of the House of Lords. Um, and I think that the contrast with last week's also fantastic speaker, Monroe, is, is, a, is a, I find really fascinating. Um, which leads me to segue for next week, the final instalment in this series. Um, with my final guest, uh, this time the Labour peer, Lord Maurice Glassman, who is an eminent political theorist, the founder of Blue Labour, um, also a good friend, someone I speak to very frequently, usually weekly, um, and I'm hoping, looking forward to a very different kind of conversation. He is not, at least at the moment, um, a member of our shul, although we can always work on that. Um, and um, we're going to um, end by thanking Gordon um, and playing a piece of music. Gordon, I'm afraid you're going to have to remind me your choice of, of music with which we'll sing the evening out. My, it's a piece of music by Haydn, not by Leonard Cohen, and not singing. It's, it's a Haydn trio played by the Bozar, I hope I wrote, the trio called um, uh, no, number 20. You'll, you'll hear it all, but I won't say any more because it's a kind of klezmer like piece of music which has stayed with me since I first heard it once as an encore piece played by the Bozar in the Wigmore Hall, maybe 40 years ago. I still hum it all the time. And I hope that your uh, uh, viewers or whatever they're called now will enjoy it as much as I do. I think it'll stick with them. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you and good night everyone.